devices work at the same time. This is quite funny because what I'm actually going to be talking about is the processes by which we record history. And uh, a part of that is obviously capturing the damn stuff in the first place. If you don't record it, there's nothing to protect. So, um, this is going to be a bit of a technical presentation. And there's a couple of different ways of describing the things I'm going to talk about. The approach that I'm taking today is quite abstract. So rather than a kind of minute explanation of how things work, I'm going to talk through these things at kind of political, structural kind of a level. And then from there, uh, if people have more technical questions, we can ask them at the end. So what I'm going to be talking about is basically the extended case of a thing called Bitcoin. Can you raise your hands if you've heard of Bitcoin? Okay. Anybody know how it works? Okay, do you want to walk here and explain it? <laughs> yeah. So Bitcoin is a bear of a thing to explain. It's one of the most complicated bits of software ever written. It's not necessarily particularly large. It's not a huge, sprawling piece of software. It's about a couple hundred thousand lines of code. But it includes more or less the total history of cryptography as a single package with a bunch of new ideas and extended to a new field called something like cryptoeconomics, if that's the name that we were going to eventually set on. And it's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of different moving parts, all of which are conceptually quite different, connected together until you produce this marvelous mechanical invention, the blockchain. Now, what a blockchain is, is it's a structured file. It's just like any other file on your computer, you know, and it's divided up into sections. This is the 10 a.m. section, this is the 10 10 section, this is the 10 20 section, this is the 10 30 section. And in each section, you've got a bunch of transactions, which are essentially payments. Bob gives Andy 20 quid, Andy gives John 30 quid, and John gives Fred 50 quid. And all of those transactions are structured in time. And uh, somebody makes a random decision about how they're going to order those transactions in the block. Lots of people look at the block and agree it's okay. Everybody signs off on it. Those are the transactions for 1030. Now we're going to go forward and do transactions for 1040. Conceptually, that all kind of is pretty simple. Now you have to imagine a bunch of people doing that in an old west saloon, pointing guns at each other where everybody accuses everybody else of lying. And we're talking about $4 billion worth of gold sitting in a wagon outside. It's the security that makes it difficult. Now, what I'm going to be positive is that the security mechanisms that are currently predicting $4 billion worth of value on Bitcoin could be extended in some fairly straightforward ways to protect our history. And you might say, well, nobody's attacking our history. Now, is that true? Can anybody think of some history that's actively under attack, a version of the past that people are trying to make go away? Holocaust? Yeah, Holocaust is a good one. Uh, has anybody heard of the Armenian Genocide? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, the Armenian Genocide is a substantial part of the, the, you know, it's a substantial fraction of the size of the Holocaust. But it's almost been washed out of history. Right? You've got some sort of vague awareness of it, but nobody can immediately conjure up an image of the Armenian Genocide. It's an Armenian images. You can't immediately identify how many people were killed because it's just faded out. It's uh, a few decades earlier than the Holocaust. The Armenians have been much less effective at preserving the memory of it. And the result is that you have the first, you know, the first real genocide of the age of genocides is almost washed out of history. And there's a ton of suppression of that history even today, particularly by the Turkish government, because nobody really wants to know what happened. So the notion that history is under continuous attack is quite an important conceptual model because it's not something that you see in your generation. Uh, I used to work with a guy who was a Vietnam veteran and he turned to me one day and said, but hey, I just realized something. Uh, it's longer since Vietnam was than Vietnam was from World War II. And when I went to Vietnam, Vietnam was ancient history. Uh, sorry, World War II was ancient history. Nobody remembered, nobody cared. It was the previous generation's war. Is that how Vietnam is for you? And I'm like, I'm a European. Right? If Vietnam was even more distant than that, he gives you this funny look, and then he shows me his front teeth, which had been uh, knocked out when he fell over uh, a broom in a warehouse uh, in Vietnam because uh, he was more air freight. And it's like, you know, every day, there they are. I mean, they'd been replaced, but they were fake teeth. 
So this notion that history is constantly washing away anyway makes this notion of deliberate attempts to erase history all the more powerful and all the more dangerous. Because if the history is naturally washing away because of the flow of time and the natural forgetfulness of the human race, when people add additional pressure to that to try and get rid of something, the tendency is for it to vanish. Does everybody know the image of Tank Man from China? Tiananmen Square, there's a row of tanks, and there's a man holding what looks like two Tesco bags standing in front of the tanks. And there's video where they try and turn the tank around and he goes and scoots across to get in the way of it the other side. And for us, right, if you remember Tiananmen Square, this is the iconic image of Tiananmen Square. In China, the image is unknown. And I was reading recently about Chinese graduate students when they come to America to you know, do their PhDs, they said the first month we walked to Wikipedia reading Chinese history. And this raises the question, well, Google will censor certain web pages in China, but not others. Uh, Google uh, eBay censors certain products in Germany, but not others. Right? What if you start censoring Wikipedia to make it regionally sensitive so that the government of the local area will give you a hard time about actually having Wikipedia? And down that path you begin, the process of censoring the present, of censoring the document, in a way that completely reshapes each generation's understanding of the past. You sort of see how this could become a phenomenon. So that's essentially what we're going to talk about in a lot more detail. But I'll give you a rough preview of where we're going because it's quite funny territory. So the risk is that in the present, you can change the documentation of the past in a way that makes the past change to all intents and purposes. Once you've made that alteration, if all the documentation in the present is consistent, whatever the actual past was, it's now lost, particularly if it's out of living memory. Right? We do it in the first cut in the process of making news. Right? Whatever the cameras choose not to look at, whatever is not broadcast doesn't exist, it doesn't become part of the stream of images which constitute the first cut of culture. But particularly in the age of the camera phone, there's always a second opinion, there's always a different perspective, there's always a new way of seeing. So this is not quite the issue that it was before we had camera phones everywhere. And you're seeing this happening right now in America, with uh, lots and lots of people filming the police doing blatantly illegal things and then asking why they were never arrested. Um, this is George Orwell's famous phrase, right? He who controls the past controls the future, he who controls the present controls the past. And this is, as far as I can tell, an absolute truth. The past doesn't exist except in the present. Um, for example, you can think of um, uh, the Taliban and ISIS going around blowing up all the historical monuments. They're erasing history as a political act. And that's a kind of history that's much harder to protect than digital history. But it's also much older. Some of that stuff's 1,000, 1,500 years old. So, what I'm going to um, talk about is why. Right? Once you have this kind of tooling, it becomes possible to lay down the cultural history of humanity in the same framework which is being used to record all the financial transactions. And this, I think, is potentially extremely important. Um, governments are the primary risk for erasure of history in an intentional way because they're the only people who really have the power to do it. But the economy is much larger than the state. Typically, the government has somewhere between 10 and 30 percent of the employees in society, often less. Uh, it's got control of a quarter and 20 percent of, uh, of the GDP, can be as low as 15. So the government is actually much smaller than the economy as a whole. And if you're using the same mechanisms that are being used to manage the economy to also record your history, you have a kind of single unified framework for storing the past. And if you start erasing history, you also start erasing the economy. And generally speaking, people are very, very, very reluctant to let people erase, for example, their property rights registers. You know, if the government, in the process of rewriting the history of Manchester, also erases all the property ownership, and everybody's house suddenly becomes free for grabs, generally speaking, people will suddenly notice something is wrong, in a way which is completely different from if you gradually bleach the past out of say the um, this notion that you could have a single mechanism which secures both the economic transactions and the historical structure of a society, I think is a new phenomenon. 
It's something that's only become possible because of Bitcoin, because of blockchains. Uh, I work with a project called Ethereum, which is kind of like a programmable version of Bitcoin. We've obviously got tons of interest in this kind of security of the past. Um, what it all bedrocks on is this idea of decentralizing the truth. Now, at the moment, the truth is generated in one place at one time. Right? You have a camera, it's embedded in time and place, you take a set of pictures, this becomes the truth. And there's always the question about what is undocumented and what is unseen, but you have this version of the truth, and there it is. As that truth spreads out, it acquires more and more, and more credibility and more and more reality because lots and lots and lots of people are paying attention to it, they're looking, they're listening, they are uh, copying it. So it makes its way, say, from a newspaper photographer to a newspaper, they print it, everybody winds up with a copy. If you want to change that piece of the past, you've got around about 30,000 or 50,000 copies of that physical newspaper. The danger is that in 10 or 20 years, Physical newspapers are likely to vanish because everybody will need to use on their Kindle or their holograph eyeglasses or whatever it happens to be. So now we have this possibility that if you want to change the past, you get hold of the newspaper image and you Photoshop it and you push the updated version to all of the devices which are connected. So you can have this notion that everything is electronic and the dissemination is instant, but the price of that is that the changes leave no footprints. So if we Photoshop a picture and then push the update to everybody's phone, if the phone silently accepts that change, what has happened has been altered and it's completely invisible. And this is why you need this kind of blockchain technology with all of this clever cryptography to produce a fixed, static, unchanging economic history. And you need to use that mechanism to secure the pictures from newspapers. You need it to secure the data that streamed out of Tiananmen Square during the actual crisis such that when the time comes, you can't simply take it back out. Right? The thing about provable agreement is this. If we all have copies of a picture, and one half of them show one truth and another half of them show another truth, it's very hard to say which is the original. So at the point of dissemination, when the images are going down, they all have to be sort of lockstep assented to. Everybody has to agree, we got the image, and this is what the image looks like. And you can use digital signatures and hashes and things like that to secure those images. Then, if somebody changes it later on, the 75% of us that have the original version can put our hands up and say, uh, my software says that that's not the original, here's what I think is the original. And you get this kind of uh, democratic shifting where it doesn't really matter what the uh, proposed change is, people will object to it simply because it is a change. And even if there's only a small minority of people are holding the original and vociferously objecting to the shifting, then you still have these mechanisms that allow you to fight back. If I can prove that something was in the New York Times from 35 years ago in a way that is uh, cryptographically secure, it doesn't matter what the archive says today, I still have proof that it was issued at the time. And these mechanisms are incredibly important because without them, how are we to know what the past really said? Um, dangers to this kind of model. So, one of the problems that we have is that increasingly the truth is copyrighted. So, when somebody goes to a, say, a press photographer goes and takes a bunch of pictures, or a news photographer goes out and a news crew takes a bunch of pictures, it's very, very common that that original capture is copyrighted. It's copyrighted by the person who took the pictures, they're being paid by a news agency, the news agency takes all the originals, they then make some edits and release that as their product. So one possibility is you get an objection to this kind of uh, locking of history in a digital form because the agencies that actually own the copyright refuse to allow it to be locked into the past. And I think that this is a very dangerous idea. We might need to begin to reconsider some of the functions of copyright to make it automatically legal to store an archival copy which is designed to protect the future from uh, manipulation by particularly the state. Um, examples of laws that are being used this way, copyright is certainly an example. The really sharp one is actually laws against videotaping police. And you see this particularly in America, but it's also present here. The police are often very, very unhappy if you videotape them. And you need special legal protection for the ability to monitor police or soldiers if they're operating in your area. Otherwise, you create an environment where the truth is never recorded in the first place. So there's nothing to protect.
we need a sort of an evenness of truth. If we're going to have a society that has a lot of TV cameras, we have CCTVs, it should be possible to use those to monitor police in exactly the same way it's possible to use them to monitor uh, the public or terrorists. And the notion that we need a uniform law, either no observation or complete observation or something in between, but that it applies equally to all of us, is how we make sure that our technological society doesn't in fact become a police state. And this is an extremely important notion. You have to equalize out the empowerment that technology offers people, or you wind up with more and more and more empowerment in fewer and fewer and fewer hands, and it creates all the same problems that you would expect from wealth concentration. Um, issues that are raised from this, right? What do we do about privacy and the right to be forgotten in a situation where you've got permanent storage of things? You know, if we have this notion of a you know, 10 10 blockchain, 10 20 blockchain, you know, 10 30 block blockchain, and this permanent rolling you know, 10 minute or 6 minute or 6 second you know, frozen digital history that we're using to store all of our credit card transactions, what do you do if when you were a teenager you had some absolutely crazy opinions that you published all over the internet and now there's no way to get rid of them? Right now, the natural fading out of history will tend to mean that the old platforms go away. If it wasn't an archive or order, you take it down, it's gone. There's still the possibility of the past fading out. Facebook is very good at this. Right? Facebook makes it quite hard to search for things that are a long time ago. It sort of presents this limited window in the present. Now, of course, their actual window is that they store everything, but they don't make it easy to get at that past, so it creates the illusion of privacy and the illusion of the right to be forgotten. So the stuff that happened on Facebook 10 years ago is not sitting there with an accessible URL that can catch people. But if we're going to have this notion of a protected history that can't be altered, we have to make some decisions about how things are included or not included in that, or how we manage our personal rights relative to it. Because if your 13-year-old uh, you know, poetry is given the same kind of permanence as uh, Tiananmen Square is given, it could potentially be very embarrassing. And we need to have a think about that, or we're going to wind up with the condition that we're beginning to get today in the UK, which is the rule of the boring, where only people that were completely dull as teenagers and completely dull in college, never took any risks, and never made any mistakes, can ever be elected. Highly important. So, um, that is the basic story. Uh, I'll add two other things that I think help keep this in perspective. So right now, there's a ton of interest in the use of drones. Right? They're being used very heavily militarily, but also about to start popping that frog in.